Well, good morning and welcome to the Tuesday Morning Bible Study on this March the 5th, 2024. Uh, today we have made it to the 16th chapter of Jeremiah. <clears throat> Having completed chapter 15 last week and noticing uh, and, and really dealing with um, one of the probably the first and one of the great examples in Jeremiah of a Moses level of honesty <laughs> between the prophet and God. Uh, Moses was uh, quite uh, quite uh, famous for the way he would stand up to God and speak his mind and and even even uh, tell God that he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> tell God to to repent and uh and in fact uh more often than not God did uh in those conversations uh here in Jeremiah Jeremiah is uh is uh bitter he's he's bitter at the lot he has been handed uh, by God and you know in uh, verse the latter part of verse 18 in chapter 15, he describes God as like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail. And of course, God has a response, uh, doesn't quite let that just go, <laughs> but but uh, there you are. All right, well, let's uh, then hit, uh, let's hit chapter 16. The word of the Lord came to me. You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place and concerning the mothers who bear them and the fathers who beget them in this land, they shall die of deadly diseases. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried. They shall become like dung on the surface of the ground. They shall perish by the sword and by famine, and their dead bodies shall become food for the birds of the air and for the wild animals of the earth. For thus says the Lord, do not enter the house of mourning or go to lament or bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people, says the Lord, my steadfast love and mercy. Both great and small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried. And no one shall lament for them. They shall be no... There shall be no gashing, no shaving of the head for them. No one shall break bread for the mourner to offer comfort for the dead, nor shall anyone give them the cup of consolation to drink for their fathers or their mothers. You shall not go into the house to feasting, to sit with them, to eat and drink. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I am going to banish from this place in your days and before your eyes the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. We're going to go ahead and continue through verse 13. And when you tell this people all these words and they say to you, why has the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? What is our iniquity? What is the sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then you shall say to them, it is because your ancestors have forsaken me, says the Lord, and have gone after other gods and have served and worshiped them and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. And because you have behaved worse than your ancestors, for here you are, every one of you, following your stubborn evil will, refusing to listen to me. Therefore I will hurl you out of this land into a land that neither you nor your ancestors have known, and there you shall serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor." Okay, let me just say that it's gonna get it's gonna get a little brighter in the next section. So <laughs> things look up just a uh, just a wee tad in the next part. But let us let us ad address ourselves to these first thirteen verses. The first thing that really stands out to me, God really means the first commandment. Uh, yeah, no other God. Yeah, no other gods before me. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's quite serious about it. <laughs> uh, quite serious about it. It's um, and and partly, I mean, partly because, you know, partly because of the reality of things that ones who go after other gods are going after non-existent gods. I mean, they're they're pursuing things that are, you know, projections of their own imaginations. But it is also because of consequences, because of the connection between idolatry and injustice, uh, because invariably idolatry for, for from the point of view of covenantal Jewish theology, idolatry inevitably leads to injustice, uh, whether it's idolatry worshiping other gods or the idolatry of the worship of power, uh, the worship of money in the name of God. All forms of idolatry inevitably lead to uh, lead to personal and social personal and social disorder that stems from from injustice. okay. Um, and so, I mean, again, it's 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 wrong. Idolatry is wrong, not just for what it is, but for its effects also. It's both. <clears throat> for, and by, and by, by, you know, to further that point, I mean, to look down at um, to look down at uh, verse eleven, for instance, where it says, uh, then you shall say to them, it is because your ancestors have forsaken me, says the Lord, and have gone after other gods and have served and worshipped them and have forsaken me and have not kept my law. Idolatry inevitably leads to neglect of the law, which, as I have said, inevitably leads to injustice because neglect of the law, it's not, it's so easy to hear that and just hear it as, you know, um, the violation of, of little infractions, you know, like walking, like, uh, uh, walking, um, walking through a no walking sign, you know, it's like, and, and therefore you are being, you're being, uh, thrown out of the land and being punished and you're going to lose your lives and all that because of little minor infractions. No, no, that's, that's not actually what this is talking about. When it talks about neglect of the law, not keeping the law, it's talking about a total, a total life vision, a total vision of community um, <clears throat> rooted in God, rooted in the exclusive worship of God, of, of Israel's God, that carries over into what human relations look like and social order looks like um <clears throat> and that's and that and, and and not doing that then leads to grave consequences um well the social the social order that he depicts is one that is completely broken down i mean mm -hmm. people don't even get buried corpses yes. just fly around in the street and you don't go to weddings and you don't go to funerals yeah yeah i mean it's 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 put in the form of this is what's coming, you know, uh, that, you know, don't even bother, don't even bother having children. Don't even bother getting married or having children because, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just doom for them. If, 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 the, if you do, um, uh, that things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. Um, <clears throat> and so, I mean, that, yeah, as you say, that is the picture that uh, God is presenting. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Do you think well, that God comes on um, this strongly with all of this stuff? Because Jeremiah has just had the whatever it takes to question God and to kind of fuss about things. And so God is saying, uh, I don't think it's, I don't it think is. I'm giving it all to you. No, well, well, in a way, in a way, yes, I started to to push back a little bit, but no, I, I, I think I see your point. I, I think he, I think he, he is. I, I agree. I think it is a response. I think it is in part a response to Jeremiah's um, upset. Um, 
in the sense that I, Jeremiah, Jeremiah has a divided heart. I mean, he hates the lot he's been handed. He absolutely hates the lot he's been handed. He he resents the fact that he's been called of God and his doing his divinely appointed job can only lead to suffering for himself. And, and then, and in that respect, he is feeling sorry for himself. Completely understandable. You know, I mean, I think any, any of us, any of us would have tried to sign off this job, you know, a while back. Um, I think it is also though, and we see it at bits in bits and pieces all throughout what we've read so far is that Jeremiah vacillates between disgust when he thinks about his people and and frustration on one hand and deep deep compassion for his people on the other which is you know again completely understandable you can it's possible to feel both at the same time to feel great compassion or i'm sorry to feel great frustration and anger and and disgust at the thought of of what your countrymen are doing and at the same time grieve what they have brought upon themselves and other and others this is this is an example this is i, I think a uh, an interesting thing to reflect on in light of our own our own times you know balancing kind of balancing the the anger and disgust we may feel which i think is you know in many respects is 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 understandable and justified and at the same time also feeling compassion for the feeling compassion for the very pe for the very people themselves uh who are going to who are going to suffer the consequences uh of these of these attitudes and these choices um i i get i, I get that completely i i really completely get that i think the back. two sides of that coin i think the two sides of that coin also apply to god god is angry yeah. God, is also, God is also grieving. Yes, yes, thank you. That is a good, good point. Um, and, and you see it, just as you see Jeremiah going back and forth in that. I mean, God is doing that too, because um, because on one hand, I mean, we saw back in, um, I think it was chapter nine, the business about, uh, you know, God acknowledging acknowledging that the suffering is coming, but it is, it's clearly God who is grieving. It's clearly God who is grieving. It's God who is shedding tears for the slain of the lost of my poor people. Uh, and so, yeah, <laughs> uh, there's also, and of course, also there's every now and then there's the hints that while things are going to get worse before they get better, that there is far off, but there is hope far off that God can be absolutely ready to on one on in one sense be ready to throw in the towel with these people and yet not yet also not be able to entirely give up on them. Um, even if God says that he's giving up on them. Because there are times, there are times where, you know, God effectively says, these aren't my people anymore. I mean, these people are just idiots. These people are lost. They're, they they don't know me. Um, and, you know, to, to act with them, you know. And yet, it's like God can't quite let go of them. And no, I'm, I'm so we, we understand this. We understand this. Yeah, Fred. I've got a little bit of a, a problem with the way the text reads, and, and that is that uh, he assumes the existence of these other gods. Uh, you've worshipped these other gods like they exist. Why yeah. doesn't God just say, these are figments of your imagination, 
ever since Moses and before, it's been proven that they have no power. <clears throat> In case you, uh, you know. Well, you know, there, uh, there. You you may recall earlier. Um, earlier in the in the book, there there are references to idols being just of stone or wood. You know, wherever you had that kind of language that they're just bowing before stone or wood. Um, that these gods, they're while they are believed to exist, they are empty. Um, and in fact, you you may recall the language of um, the language of people going after that which is worthless and so becoming worthless themselves. Uh -huh. Okay. That, so there is an acknowledgement that these gods, these other gods that are believed by some people to exist are, are vain. They're empty. They're, they, they, they don't, in fact, don't exist. Right. But the fact that they are believed in, you know, provides an opportunity to speak of them as fixtures in human imagination, you know, as as things that, you know, can be responded to, so to speak. Um, now, we'll say historically that this is the, the period leading into and during the exile is that great shift in Jewish religious conception, uh, that movement from Hanafism to, uh, to monotheism, to pure monotheism, um, the shift from the belief in the God of Israel as the most, the best God, the most powerful God, but one God among others that also exist in the universe. And that actually was the prevailing Jewish view um really right up to the eve of exile and even going into the exile there were many jews who <clears throat> understood the god of israel as one god among others that the prophets call us to worship exclusively and as better than other gods and as certainly one who makes would make a covenant with us and who would covenant to protect us and if we obey his law and so forth. Um, but it was really the eve of the exile and the exile that led to a and led to a movement into seeing the God of Israel not just as the best God, but in fact as the only God. Um, <clears throat> as the as the one God who can, uh, the one God worthy of worship, the one God who in fact, exists the Lord of the whole world. Okay. We see that shift during we, we see that move completed during the exile. Yeah, all right. So Jeremiah, you know, I mean, all to say the same thing in another way. Jeremiah is living in this era when this shift is happening. Okay. Um, I will say too that um, you you see a lot of this. Um, bold expression of a kind of a, a, a kind of freshly minted monotheism in the writing of second Isaiah in the book of Isaiah starting in chapter 40 and really if you read Isaiah in the 40s the the uh, you know like 40 to 50 um read those read those chapters in Isaiah written towards the end of the exile and you see a bold statement of the utter uniqueness of of the God of Israel and the utter emptiness of all other of all other gods. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's push ahead then. Let's let's start. Uh, let's read verse fourteen through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Therefore, the days are surely coming, says the Lord. When it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought the people out of Israel up out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, 
who brought the people of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their ancestors. I am now sending for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my presence, nor is their iniquity concealed from my sight. And I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin because they have polluted my land with the carcasses of their detestable idols and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. O Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of trouble, to you shall the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, our ancestors have inherited nothing but lives, worthless things in which there is no profit. Can mortals make for themselves gods? Such are no gods. Therefore, I am surely going to teach them. This time I am going to teach them my power and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. Oh, wow. Okay. There's a lot here. There's a lot here to reflect on. You notice the shift in voice. and There's, there's a shift in voice through this. Well, in nineteen in nineteen through twenty one, uh -huh. I assume that when we get, it reads, "Oh Lord, my strength and my stronghold," that's Jeremiah, right? It is Jeremiah, and is uh, it Jeremiah? Or actually, uh, verses nineteen, ver at least verse nineteen, and probably twenty also, nineteen and twenty. Yeah, that's that, that's definitely Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah speaking. Then, then is it God when we? Where, where is it? when you get down in 21 it's who, god speaking I, yeah it's god speaking in the I down there is god the i in the last verse yes. is god yeah verse 21 appears to be or at least this is the way it's presented in my bible and i and i think it's right verse 21 is presented as the voice of god being quoted by jeremiah so it's Ooh. like jeremiah in 19 and 20 it's jeremiah's voice and then in verse 21, Jeremiah is speaking. It's like it's like a part of a speech or part of a sermon, but he's quoting God. You know, in other words, verse 21 could be prefaced by saying, by Jeremiah saying, he's Jeremiah has just spoken verses 19 and 20 as himself. And then and then he could preface verse 21. As God told me. Therefore, I am surely going to teach them this time. I'm going to teach them like that. Yeah. Well, well he does in those verses, which we had read before, <clears throat> he does essentially what you said. He says that there aren't any other gods except me. Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. I mean, it's clear to me that Jeremiah sees it that way. You know, I mean, definitely Jeremiah sees it that way. He has come to that view. The rest of the people... You know, the rest of the people are going to catch up to that, uh, certainly during the exile, those who are who hold on to hope, hold on to the to the practices of, of faith, you know, are going to come along to that. But yeah, I, yeah, clearly Jeremiah is already there. Um, In the NIV version, um, starting at verse 21 and going on through um Four in the next chapter, it's uh, all in quotes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Same in the in RSV. Absolutely. Um. Uh, yeah. Now the fishermen and the hunters, um, they are going after the um, Israelites who have been dispersed. Is that correct? Yes. But they're going after them. Uh, but they're going after them for um, to make sure that they get the full measure of punishment. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. 
Now, this is, you know, the very fact that they brought this up, uh, the very fact that they even used the word fisherman, this is, you know, naturally for us, this is going to make us think of the New Testament, think of the Gospels, Jesus, uh, you know, the, the disciples being fishermen, not, not just literally fishermen in some cases, but that their role as disciples, as spreaders of the good news is fishermen. I think it is instructive to compare the two because, as we have seen, there's there's almost nothing in the Gospels that's accidental. Almost nothing. And almost everything in the Gospels has some kind of Old Testament antecedent. Those of you who are in my understanding the Bible class will uh, remember that this past week I spoke of the Old Testament being the source of the sacred imagination of the first Christians, of the first Jewish followers of Jesus, that the Old Testament, as we know it, the Old Testament was their Bible. Uh, and when they wrote, when they were writing the New Testament, writing the epistles, writing the gospels, they had no consciousness they were writing new scriptures. Um, they Their scripture was the Old Testament. And therefore, the way they thought about the world, the way they organized it, categorized it, and the way they, in, this is very important, the way they interpreted experience the way they interpreted their own experience was through the images the categories the symbols of the old testament we know already we've seen already how jesus <laughs> was informed by and the early christian telling of what jesus was up to was informed by jeremiah the way what Je what what Jesus believed and what the Christians believed about what Jesus believed, what he was doing in the temple, very much connects to what Jeremiah is doing with the temple in Jeremiah seven. Okay, so we already know that. Now, it's interesting then to consider how this use in verse sixteen of the fishermen image might compare in um i started to say in an ironic way but that's probably not the word i mean um it, it it's the way it's used the way the fisherman image is used here and the way the fisherman image is used in the gospels um it's it's certainly it's contrasting, but I think the contrast is an interesting contrast, and I think it's actually instructive. In the here in as I said, uh, uh, Linda, as I said uh, here in verse sixteen, the idea is I'm sending fishermen, I'm sending people out to find the people who are dispersed, so that they get their full measure, full measure of of punishment. Okay, that's. It's it's it is a work of God, but it is the work of judgment. It is it is negative in that sense. Okay, it's like God's not done with giving these people what they what they have coming to them. I'm sending out fishermen. In the New Testament, the Gospel, sending out fishermen, but now it's fishermen to gather people into the kingdom. Okay. Um, we've also already seen, if you recall, um, if you recall the language of, uh, the first chapter of Mark, uh, when we studied Mark together and we saw how in chapter one, the exile, the experience of exile, the voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, even the language concerning John the Baptist and the and the presentation of the kingdom in Mark one harkens back to the language of the Babylonian exile. And just as just as God brought about the exile, God also engages in the work of freeing from exile. 
of people returning home from exile. God has established that intention in verses 14 and 15. Okay, now stuff's got to happen before that before that happens. Stuff has got to happen before that happens, but the divine intention is ultimately returned after all the bad stuff happens. Ultimately, ultimately it's returned. And just as the fishermen initially go out to make sure that everybody gets what has they, what in a divine sense they have coming to them, in the new in the New Testament, in the Gospels, there's also fishermen, but this time it's fishermen to bring people back home. To bring people back home. This is a beautiful example, beautiful example of how the message of Jeremiah is creatively appropriated by the gospel writers. And just as they used exile and return in Mark 1 and, and in other places, they used the image of the fisherman, whereas before it's an instrument of judgment. Here, or in the God or in the Gospels, the fishermen become the 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 people who seek people out to bring them back home from exile. Oh, oh that's good. That's good. Okay. I mean, I, I, if there's nothing else that you get from these things, I mean, you guys are faithful. You guys are faithful. You come every week. You know. There's only one thing you get. Get this. Get that. Get the unity of the Old and New Testaments. Get the the, the unity of the Old and New Testaments and the and the the rich mine of reservoir of 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 religious consciousness and sensibilities and and symbols and images that the New Testament employs to proclaim the gospel. Um, they all come from the Old Testament. <laughs> uh, um, if if Ray Stover could hear you from God, ah! and I believe he does, I know he would be so proud. <laughs> there are things he would differ with me on, I'm confident, but uh, but yes, I, I received that. I hear you and I received that. Uh, Ray Stover, for the rest of you, Ray Stover was our associate pastor, uh, my home church in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, as I was growing up. Uh, I, I want to say he probably came to our church when I was probably 10, 11, 10 or 11 years old, and was, was the associate pastor all through my formative years and into my college years. Uh, and he is somebody who even even more even more than our than our senior pastor who also influenced me too uh he probably influenced me more than any other single ordained person in my formative years uh in terms and 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 what my mom is referring to specifically is that Ray Stover had a very often expressed reverence for the Old Testament uh, a very often expressed uh, reverence for it. And he was a hundred percent right <laughs> about that. He was absolutely right to reverence it uh, because he saw he saw better and deeper than just about anybody else I knew during my during my early life. Uh, just how deeply how how the new testament is incomprehensible without the old uh, you you just you can't understand the new testament without being rooted in the old you or you have to or at the very least you have to study them together you have to study the new when you study the new testament you have to study it with constant reference to the old uh, and he was so right about that and and no no question but that he influenced me along those lines all right. So uh, notice also in verse 18, notice also this language 
where it says, and I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin. I will doubly repay. That's interesting. That's an interesting thing. I mean, God is clearly interested in, not just in, in heaping punishment on people, but also in the sense of totally removing the stain. It's like, it's like putting something through the laundry and then after the cycle is done, taking it out and retreating it and putting it back in the wash, you know, even if it's not entirely necessary, it is done nevertheless to totally, totally get it clean and to send the message that it's totally clean. Uh, that language then gets used about probably from the standpoint of when this is written, gets picked up about 50 years later in Isaiah 40. In Isaiah 40, where it says in Isaiah 40, Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her yeah. sins. Jeremiah was written, this part of Jeremiah was written first. Isaiah 40 was written about 50 years later. Isaiah 40 knows what Jeremiah said. And now recognizes that the work that Jeremiah, for, that for from Jeremiah's point of view, was only starting, was only about to start happening. In Isaiah 40's time, it's, it's, it's the proclamation of the good news that it's been completed, that the second wash cycle has, has been completed. <laughs> uh <laughs> so that is good. Um notice too when we get to what Jeremiah says uh in verse 19, where he does say, O Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of trouble, to you shall the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, our ancestors have inherited nothing but lies, worthless things in which there is no profit. Can mortals make for themselves gods? Such are no gods. This is not said as clearly as it, or, or it may not be, let me just say, it may not be as clear as it could be. But what this is also, what this is pointing to, and it's one of the first, it's one of the first hints of this uh that the prophets the prophets talk about is the idea that the restoration of Israel as a people following exile following all that that the ultimate goal is not just the redemption of Israel Israel returning from exile it's not just so that they are restored, but to fulfill that old, old promise that in the redemption of Israel and through Israel would come the larger salvation of the world. Mm -hmm. This idea gets expressed, gets expressed in the latter, in the second half of Isaiah, rather explicitly. Um, you, you may recall the uh, Isaiah 60, uh, written by so-called third Isaiah, after folks have returned from the exile, after the, after the Jews that returned to rebuild Jerusalem come back from the exile. In Isaiah 60, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines upon you. And then it, and then it proceeds to talk about how people are coming from all over to see... There, to come to the light that God is now shining from Jerusalem. And people are people all over the world are responding to that light, this vision of what God has done in returning the people from exile 
is something that is is a is a redemption that then shines for the rest of the world to see to see the glory of the lord and ultimately leads to salvation for the whole world this is this is first hinted at in real i mean first really gotten at in the prophets concerning the uh the exile and the end of the exile and jeremiah here in verse 19 is hinting at that, hinting at this idea that the purpose of this exile and ultimately this return is for the nations to see what God has done. To see, for the nations to see what God has done and to come to Jerusalem to follow the light and to admit that its idols are vain. The people that come, uh, <clears throat> the people that come from the ends of the earth and say our ancestors have inherited nothing but lies, these are not Jews. These are the nations that say this. Okay. And this is Jeremiah praying that. I mean, this is what Jeremiah is praying. Um but Jeremiah is saying that these people are going to come from the ends of the earth. Uh, the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, our ancestors have inherited nothing but lies. The Gentiles. This imagines Gentiles coming and saying, and it's all towards the end of redeeming not just the not just the people of Israel, this is big, but redeeming the experience of exile, that even the exile, even though it was punishment, even though it was punishment, that even the exile had a redemptive purpose. It was not just punishment. It was punishment, but it wasn't just punishment. It also had a redemptive purpose. Um, yeah. Mm. Good. Good. All right. Let us, let us continue into chapter 17. We've got just a little more time, and I think we, I think we can um, deal with the first part of chapter 17. All right, let's read verses 1 through 13 in 17. The sin of Judah is written with an iron pen. With a diamond point, it is engraved on the tablet of their hearts and on the horns of their altars, while their children remember their altars and their sacred poles. Beside every green tree and on the high hills, on the mountains, in the open country, your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your sin throughout all your territory. By your own act, you shall lose the heritage that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. For in my anger, a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is, in, who, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not bear, cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart, to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. 
like the partridge hatching what it did not lay, so are all who amass wealth unjustly. In midlife it will leave them, and at their end they will prove to be fools. O glorious throne, exalted from the beginning, shrine of our sanctuary, O hope of Israel, O Lord, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be recorded in the underworld. For they have forsaken the fountain of living water, the Lord. Let's just continue through verse 18 and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. See how they say to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come. But I, Jeremiah, have not run away from being a shepherd in your service, nor have I desired the fatal day. You know what came from my lips. It was before your face. Do not become a terror to me. You are my refuge in the day of disaster. Let my persecutors be shamed, but do not let me be ashamed, or do not let me be shamed. Let them be dismayed, but do not let me be dismayed. Bring on them the day of disaster. Destroy them with double destruction. Okay. Kind of obvious. We've got changes of voice in, in this. Uh, Earlier, he had said all would be destroyed. And here Jeremiah is asking for to be saved, not do not destroy me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, it, you know, it's a reaffirmation of something that has been going on, you know, throughout that uh, that part of the promise that God gives Jeremiah at the beginning is it's going to go terrible. It's going to go really, really bad. Uh, for everybody. But, but you're for everybody, including you. I mean, I mean, you're in the midst of a people that are, you know, going to hell in a handbasket, but your life will be preserved. I mean, and that's the promise from the beginning is that no matter how bad things get, your life is going to be preserved. Now, <laughs> it may not be a life much worth living, but it's, but your life is going to be preserved. Uh, you're going to, uh, you're going to survive. Uh Yeah. I think, I think this is very human. Um, Jeremiah is saying, all right, God, it, this is going to get bad, but I am putting in with you. I am giving over to you. I'm trusting you. But, you know, it's just like, like uh, it's very human. It's a, it's a human yeah. reaction to what oh, God yeah. has been telling him is going to happen. Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh you know verse verse 17 and 18 it, you know um uh you do not become a terror to me you know uh you are my refuge and that I mean, it's like you're my only hope you're the only one i've got i mean the rest of these people they've cast me off i'm, I'm doing what you told me i'm saying what you told me to say they're leaving me don't but i've been a them. good boy <laughs> yeah, I've been a good boy. Don't you leave me too, you know? And uh, and that's, so it's, you know, as, as Jeremiah sees things falling around him, he's he's aware of this. And, um, but then in verse 18, you know, then it turns towards, you know, it was alternately, he's, you know, in earlier chapter, he was, he turned on God. He was upset with God for what God has done. And here he is, you know, God uh, essentially vindicate me in the sight of my persecutors or, or, or not only don't let my persecutors get me, but show them, you know, cause them to be put to shame. You know, don't let me be put to shame. Let them be put to shame. Um, let it be ultimately shown that I was right and they were wrong, <laughs> you know. Uh, kind of reminds me of, of David talking in the Psalms, you know, where yeah. he praises God and everything. But, you know, I, I want you to get those people that I don't like. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, David. Yeah. David does that a lot. There's a lot of language of that. You know, my my enemies, uh, those who are uh, who are uh, opposed to me or standing standing up to me. Now, of course, it's all based on 
rightly or wrongly, it's based on the idea that what the speaker represents is the way of God, even if that way of God is being resisted by other people, it's being persecuted by other people. Uh, the idea is, God, save me, protect me, but also don't let me be put to shame. In other words, don't let me suffer humiliation uh, because of what I am doing. Instead, humiliate those who are resisting me because I am standing up for righteousness, because I'm standing up for the way of God. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So so that whole prayer, that whole prayer for vindication really starts in verse 14. Um, the, let's see, I want to go back just a little bit here before we or we have to wrap up. Um, you may, uh, you probably noticed back at the beginning of the chapter, uh, which uh, which uh, Bev earlier uh, rightly said is a continuation of the uh, the idea that was in the previous chapter at the end with verse twenty one. Uh, the sin of Judah is written with an iron pen with a diamond point is engraved on the tablet of their hearts. Uh, while their children remember their altars and their sacred poles beside every green tree and on the high hills, on the mountains, in the open country. Okay, now devoid of context, <laughs> devoid of context, that sounds beautiful and uplifting. Oh, the everlasting hills, the green hills, and the... Mm -hmm. And the green trees and the high hills. And I mean, it sounds beautiful. It sounds sound of music y, you know. Uh, that is absolutely not what's in view here. Uh, the um, the uh, sacred poles beside every green tree and on the high hills, on the mountains, in the open country, these are shrines to idols. Anytime it talks about high places in the prophets, pretty much guarantee that it's about a an idolatrous worship space um and it's these things that the children of judah the people of judah are thinking of as they enter into what is about to happen to them it is this that is it is this their idolatry that is engraved on them it's I mean, it's like they've totally given themselves over to it. It's written on them, which is why they're about they're about to experience what they're going to experience. Um, um, yeah. And by your own act, you shall lose the heritage that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land you do not know. For in my anger, a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. And that verse right there, that latter part of the uh, verse uh, four, is open to some open to some interpretation. <laughs> uh, I will make you serve your enemies a land that you do not know. That, that's obvious. That's referring to Babylonians. Uh, for in my anger, a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Now, I suppose there are two ways of, of understanding that. Uh, either this is a this is a threat that God doesn't go through with, like I'm going to be angry forever, I'm going to cast you off forever, which God doesn't actually end up doing in the name of mercy, in the name of returning the people from exile and so forth. Or you could possibly <laughs> read that as, a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. It is a the fire that shall burn forever is true, but it's not, it doesn't burn forever against the people once they've been redeemed. It's the but the fire that burns forever is the fire against idolatry, against the sin, against a sinfulness that would lead people astray. 
that's what the fire burns against or burns forever is against that against that idolatry uh that would be my that would be my own reading so again subjects open to dispute i i believe but uh that's how i would read it um uh, all right. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let us then wrap up for today. We've done a chapter and a half. Look at us, man. We are just rocking it. Um, I will say next week. Next week we are going to be dealing with a uh, an image that is very very important for the new testament uh in chapter 18 obviously we're going to start at verse 19 here in 17 next week um but uh in chapter 18 there's the image of the potter and the clay and that is going to be an image that the new testament picks up uh once again, among many images that the New Testament picks up from the book of Jeremiah. All right. Well, let us then go ahead and wrap up for today. We'll pick up next week at uh, chapter 17, verse 19. And uh, as we as we close, let's um, let's do remember uh, Sarah Harrington and Hughes Allen. And uh, of course, pray for uh, for Sarah uh, Gordon. Um, uh, Lois, how, how's Bill, how's Bill? I haven't um, asked you about Bill. I'm I'm muted. No, I'm not muted. He's, he's getting a lot of medicine and stuff. So, he, I mean, he got an iron infusion again, two of them and got just, he's just started his medicine on, um, uh, for the osteoporosis, which he has in his back, which is why his vertebrae, uh, have cracked back there, uh, which had me on the phone all afternoon yesterday with, Medicare and and our and our various supplements to see if this was going to be paid for and uh yeah I think he's feeling a little better but you know there's no no great gains you know he, yeah. he says he's not in as much pain which is the main thing yeah yeah well please he can, use, he can use all the prayers that he can get I'll tell you so. yeah no. do do let him know that we're that we pray for, we do pray for him uh, ongoing ongoing so. All right. Well, let's uh, let's close with prayer then, and then we'll we'll depart. Lord, we give you thanks for this day and for this chance to to be together again this week. We uh, we are grateful, though we're shaken up by it sometimes. We are grateful for this word of Jeremiah, uh, and for your word that comes through comes through these these ancient words. We see what, yet again just how timely and relevant. Uh, this word is to us, and we pray that you truly let it into us, into our hearts, so that we might hear your direction for our lives and for the world in which we are called to uh, to witness and to act. Lord, we, uh, we also lift up to you those who are on our prayer list, uh, all those who are on our very church's prayer lists, and for those that we've named here today, we do lift up to you for healing Sarah Harrington and Hughes Allen. Pray that that for both of them that you that you work healing in both, that you restore them to good and strong health. Lord, we uh, we pray for caregivers and and for nurses and doctors that uh, that that are working on their behalf. Lord, we pray for uh, for Sarah and for Bill and for uh, for all those uh, whom we remember right now. Lord, we uh, we also pray for peace in the world, in a world that is uh, and a society that is uh, divided and uh, suffers so much violence. We pray for your peace and for your justice. And we pray that we might be witnesses to that, to that gospel in all that we do. We pray all these things now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.